So, uh, hello to those people that are just joining us. We're just going to uh, wait a, a, about one minute for uh, all of the registered participants to uh, come online. And once they're online, we'll um, we'll get started. So, for now, we'll just fill in the uh, uh, the next minute with a little chat. Uh, we've got Gordon and Lou there. They are at in Cronulla or what do you call it down there? Far and near where we are. Yes. So on on firm ground at last, Gordo. Yes. Yes. <laughs> What's the name remember. of your bay again? I always forget your bay. Yarra Matter Bay. Yeah. Port Hacking. And it's in, in the, the Port, Port Hacking. Hacking yeah. Yes. Oh, very good. And uh, you had a good homecoming the other day? We did. We had, uh, it looked like half the Shire out there, but we had a lot of friends and family out there and some big lenses pointing at us. And we had a lovely sail out down from Sydney Harbour, actually. It was beautiful. Oh, it was a perfect day, weather-wise. And when does a uh, local newspaper plan on um, publishing a story? <laughs> <laughs> we don't know, Greg. We're, we're not sure. We're not privy to that. I think <laughs> next week is their publishing date. They missed this week, so it may happen. It may happen. We're not guaranteed. <laughs> Uh, very good. So listen, we're still just waiting for those people who are just joining into the webinar. We're just standing by until we have uh, um, the uh, what we believe is a number of people who've registered to join uh, have dialed in or logged in. So we're just uh, about halfway there at the moment. So we'll just wait another minute or so and then we'll get rolling with today's webinar. Uh, for those who haven't seen me before, my name is Greg Boller. Um, I'm the new yacht sales manager here at multi Hole Solutions, and I think this is about our number seven of our webinars that we uh, dreamt up as a, uh, an idea at the start of COVID. Uh, obviously, we're not the only organisation doing this. It's become the way of the world now, uh, but the, the webinars have proven to be very successful. And for those of you who've missed any webinars, you can now go on YouTube onto the multi Hole Solutions YouTube channel. And on that channel, you can um, uh, find the webinars. They're, they're there and uh, you can click in and have a look at any, any of the webinars that we've already presented. I think there's still one or two that haven't been uploaded yet because they're still being edited. Um, but that, that's a really good resource that we now have. Uh, the purpose of today's webinar is to have a chat to Gordon and Louise Coates, who on that beautiful Elba 45 that you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, which is in fact their boat. Uh, this was the yacht that was used uh, for promotional work because their boat was hole number one. And so that picture there, I believe Gordo was taken in uh, Portugal, is that right? Correct. Yeah, that isn't Gordon on the helm and it's not me on the bow. <laughs> <laughs> that was down at Lagos, just south of uh, Lisbon after the yeah. dealers meeting, yes. Yeah, last very good. 12 months ago. So look, it looks like we've uh, given everyone enough time. Anyone that comes in now, unfortunately, will have to uh, accept that they're coming in late. So we'll just click through now and uh, we'll get rolling with today's presentation, which is uh, the webinar on Gordon and Lou's big adventure. Um, as we've done with all our other webinars, if you do have any questions that you'd like to pose throughout the, um, uh, the presentation, feel free to type them in your Q&A box. You'll see the Q&A box there. Uh, we will then attempt to either answer the questions as we go, or we'll, uh, we'll bank them up and uh, have a question and answer at the end. Uh, we tend to answer questions that are relevant to the topic that's being discussed. We'll try to answer those questions while we're on that topic. But if your question is more of a general question, we might just uh, leave that one to the end. So don't be offended if we don't answer your question straight away. Um, our next webinar is on the 17th of July, two weeks time. That's an exciting one for our powerboat. Um, um, customers, it's the Iliad 70 walkthrough. This was the uh, Iliad that we had on presentation at last year's Sydney Boat Show. It would have been on display at this year's Sydney Boat Show as well, but unfortunately that show is not going ahead. 
so that's the 17th of July, we'll be doing that. And then on the 31st of July, we're doing a tips for purchasing a pre-owned multi-hole uh, webinar, which will also be very good for those people who are looking at the uh, brokerage product. Uh, that picture there is our sales display at the Gold Coast, um, at the boat works on the Gold Coast. So that's an example of uh, how we present our multi-hole, our brokerage multi-holes up there on the Gold Coast. And then we're doing two weeks after that, a live walkthrough of our MY44 power catamaran. So this is the same power catamaran that we had on display last weekend, last Friday and Saturday at our Sydney Open for Inspection Day, which was a fantastic event. Uh, we had around about six, 60 uh, groups of clients come through over the two days on the MY44 and also on the Elba 45 with Gordon and Louise there with us. First aid for cruising is on the 28th of August at 2pm. That will be a very useful uh, and, and great topic uh, following on from uh, the one we had a few weeks ago about introduction to cruising. So that'll be a really good uh, webinar on the 28th of August. And then we've got uh, Mariner Boatings uh, in conjunction with our self webinar on the 11th of September. And that's all about cruising the Greek islands and the coast of Turkey and incorporates an event that we have that was going to run this year in May, but we've postponed till next year, which is a uh, uh, escapade through uh, the Greek and Turkish islands. So that will be uh, something that you can join in and look at on the 11th of, of September. And then, um, as I said, I'm the New York sales manager. In the background, we've got Rachel Crook, our marketing manager. She is getting quite used to it now, uh, just managing the back end of this so that everyone can uh, see it and communicate. And then um, I'd like to now introduce Gordon and Louise, who are sitting at home. I'm going to hand over to them and uh, let them start having a chat. The way we're going to do today's webinar is it'll be a bit of a question and answer between myself and Gordon and Lou. Lou. Uh, so to start with, Gordon and Lou, welcome. Um, it's fantastic to have you back on uh, Australian soil. And, you, I think, and I think there's a lot of people really looking forward to hearing about your journey from France or France to Australia over this uh, last few months. So to start with, Maybe if you could just give us a bit of a rundown on who you are. Sure, sure. And uh, hello, everyone. Hello there. Nice that you could join us today. And we're very excited to be home. It's hard to believe that uh, we've, we've done it all. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, a bit of a rundown on who we are and what our background is. Uh, I grew up sailing on small dinghies. And early in our romance and relationship, we actually sailed together on a... a um, Cherub to, Cherub to start with, and then a NS14 Northbridge Senior. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, prior to me, well, prior to us getting married, actually. We, yeah, early then, in the romance. Early in the romance. So then I, I was a, an engineer at Qantas early days, and then we, I became a, a pilot. I went on to flying and ended up retiring after 42 years as a captain on the uh, A380. But and we now have three beautiful daughters. We do. And uh, four grandchildren. Yeah. And our first Fontaine Peugeot uh, that we owned was the Arana 44. And since then, we've done a lot, of, a lot of sailing, not only in Australia, but overseas as well. And uh, during this time with the Arana, that began our relationship with Mark uh, Elkington and his team at now multi Hull Solutions. Uh, we became ambassadors, actually working at boat shows for them with our boat originally, and then in between boats, we had periods where we could stand and, and explain and, and, and discuss our experience and the vessels we were on, and that went on for uh, many years and is still going on. So, yeah, we're a resource that uh, uh, we're happy to share our experience and our knowledge of uh, the boats. We enjoy that, and as you know, we've just finished our big trip from France on the brand new Elba 45. So you've owned a few Fontaine Bajos, Gordon and Lou, so... We have. Yes, we were early adapters, really, of all three models. Um, we leapt in uh, and we, we, we were impressed with the engineering and design of the early boats. And when we saw the designs of the, these models that came up, which you can see up there on the screen, they were all ordered 
off a drawing really prior to the final design and finish. So we were really early adapters getting into We were into these very boats. trusting, but it worked. <laughs> <laughs> so we were confident after our experience on the Arana, very confident to continue forward on the Helia 44 and the, and the uh, Elba. So the Arana we actually had delivered to Australia. The Helia 44 was a factory pickup. And as you know, the hull number one of the Elba 45 was picked up in France and sailed directly home. Yeah, so uh, that image there you can see on the screen is uh, the Helia at the completion of our Atlantic crossing in 2014. Now that's uh, a parasailer you can see flying with no other sails up. And that was our favourite sail. That still is. That's a beautiful sail. Downwind sailing. For downwind it's sailing, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a question from uh, uh, one of our owners, actually. Uh, our owner's in waiting, but I'll save it for now. It's just a question about the parasailer. So we'll get to that shortly when we're talking about the Atlantic okay. crossing. Yeah. Okay. And then you uh, you chose FP. Why? Why? How did you get to be an FP buyer? What, what drove you into the FPs in the beginning? When we started looking at catamarans, um, we'd sort of dreamt up a wish list of uh, what sort of features we liked. And when we saw the, the um, design of the Arana 44, it just ticked all the boxes. Yeah, it was the perfect uh, uh, design that they presented to us, this new model. And then we were given the opportunity, we put an order in. We actually flew to France and looked uh, over the factory as well. We were given uh, a really wonderful experience there to see how they built these boats. And uh, the Arana was, we well, well they're FP boats, we think are true blue water sailing catamarans, giving uh, a lot of freeboard, dry deck, and also good bridge deck clearance. And that was one of the uh, defining features that we liked as well. Yeah, great reputation that, uh, mm. open ocean. Yeah. The images there you can see on the screen too, uh, that's the Arana entering uh, into uh, our favourite waterway of Port Hacking and sitting on the uh, water there at uh, Lady Sunset. Mus Sunset at Lady Musgrave. Mm. Um, within our budget is one of the prompts there. Uh, with our first boat, our initial plan was to get this size catamaran for retirement. But as we say, when we saw the design of the Arana, we just thought, well, why not? Let's do it now and get some experience of sailing a boat of that size. Yeah, you know, was, when was that? Pardon? 2006, Greg. Uh, I was still working. Yes. So we had that. Uh, it arrived here on in December 2006. So, yeah. And where would that Arana be now? Pardon? Oh, it's, oh, it's actually in Sydney, Sydney, Harbour. Sydney Harbour in Middle Harbour. Yeah. Okay. Still in being enjoyed and loved by uh, the same owner. couple who bought the boat from us. Yeah. Wow. Okay. But the cat, that size boat too, I mean, the 44 desire size, we are also were aware once we experienced live aboard and, and sailing the Arana, we realized this was a Goldilocks size catamaran now for a catapult couple. Uh, it gave you the volume and the sailability, the blue water capa uh, capability and uh, actually handling ability around docks and things too. So it was an ideal size boat for a couple, husband and wife to manage. Yeah. And uh, our role as ambassadors, we sort of fell into that role, as we said, because we had one of the first Fontaine Peugeot boats of that model in Australia. And uh, we, we just enjoy meeting like-minded people and telling our story and uh, sharing the passion. It's mm. good fun. Uh, very good. And now <clears throat> about 80% of our clients over the last number of years have chosen the factory pickup as the way in which to purchase and, and, and enjoy their Fontaine Peugeot. Um, so you've done that. I think you've done that twice now. Is that correct? That's correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so can you explain why I, after the first boat coming the, the, the second boat, the Helia 44, why did you choose the factory pickup? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, with Gordon, um, coming up to retirement, I think that first heading says it all. I needed to get out of the house. <laughs> I was the one at home with um, our beautiful daughters and Gordon, when he was working, was jet setting all around the world. So uh, when working, the opportunity, working, working, working. Yeah. <laughs> but when the opportunity came up and the suggestion was that we pick up the boat from in France and sail at home, I was the first person to put my hand up. 
Yes. Yeah, so the Irana, we'd, we went to a boat show that uh, at the fourth year we had this boat and we were presented with this idea of this replacement model that was coming, a new model. And uh, we sat in front of Mark and I said, look, I don't know if we can afford all this. And Mark said, you can. He said, we do have a buyer, but there's one, one catch. He said, you've got to sail the boat home if you want to get it home because <laughs> we couldn't afford to ship it home. But the experience that we had picking up this new model, which fell within our budget, and it also became a, um, a retirement sort of stepping stone for, for myself and Louise, because we wished to go out and, 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 and explore the world, didn't we? That was we part did. of what we was did. coming. And yeah. we've so enjoyed it. Um, and out in that cruising community, uh, we've met some fabulous people. Mm. made some wonderful friends and established friendships that I think will be lifelong friendships. But the mm. factory pickup experience itself, it's just something that people will treasure when they do this. Mm. It's a, it's, it, that, there's a dedicated team from uh, Multi Health Solutions that do look after you up there. You've got wonderful, uh, it's a beautiful area to visit to start with, but then you've got the opportunity to sail into the the Med, passing Spain, Portugal, and, and that's a whole new world down there. You know, the sailing in the Mediterranean is just amazing. And if you do it within seasons, it's something we did for two summer seasons. It's a, it's a magnificent place it's to very cruise special. around. Yeah, very mm. special. Very good, and you met a lot of great people. So oh, yes. We've met folk now that we've got friendships with since 2013, 14. Um, from around the world really and they were following us all the way across on this voyage home through our uh, tracking link but they they've become close friends that we've now visited in america and etc and so yeah you meet up some beautiful people very not very nice people out in the water it's a lot of fun oh, that's fantastic okay so now we get to the nuts of to, to the crux of today's uh discussion which is you just decided to sail in 90 days from France to Australia um, on the brand new Alba 45. So I think we need a little bit of background about how, how that came about. Sure. Well, the background uh, to us uh, having the Helia 44, enjoying two seasons in the Med, then the Atlantic crossing and exploring through the Caribbean and onto the USA. Um, our intention was always to get that boat home to share with family and friends. But uh, unfortunately, once we were in America, we came home and my mum wasn't well. We decided to stay home and ultimately um, or eventually sold that boat. So the new model was... So I have to ask, where, where, yep. have to ask, where is that Helia now? Oh, it was bought ah. by a lovely New Zealand couple. And they had... Uh, well, they continued. They took the boat. Where are they now? They, they, yeah, they picked the boat up in Chesapeake Bay, went back down to the Caribbean. <clears throat> then they cruised there for a, a two seasons. Mm. And now they're in the Pacific and they're actually in uh, around Tahiti, around the Isles yeah. of Tahiti. Mm. I think it's always great to just know where, the, where each boat ends up. We follow <laughs> their, their adventures on Facebook and it's just lovely to see them enjoying the boat that's we, we'd been four years you know without this uh, without a boat and we'd been tempted all the way you know we were always thinking about wish we could get back onto the water and, and complete our dream of sailing this boat into the pacific and, and exploring the pacific and uh we'd quarantined that money we got from our helia sail and we just had enough to cover this opportunity of picking up this new model and it fell within our budget. And, uh, you know, Mark uh, presented us with this opportunity and it became, uh, yeah, something we really thought we can do this. Yeah, and especially doing it in relationship with multi health Solutions. Um, uh, yeah, they've offered great support and traveled the, the journey with us. Mm. Mm. So yeah, Completing our original plan was really uh, what we thought, and we thought we'd be able to cruise in the Pacific on the way home. Uh, yeah, and also, you 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, we thought. We thought, <laughs> and we and we and we wanted to continue our opportunity to work with uh, multi hole Solutions as ambassadors, and and show this boat off here on the east coast or in Australia. So oh, and good. and really to have the boat here to share with family and friends was probably one of the one of the strong pushing points as well. So we saw the yacht obviously at the the dealer conference in Portugal last year. And then after that, we saw it again at the, the, the Can Boat Show. Um, so, you know, it, it was, for many of us in the, in the business, we felt like we already knew your yacht. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> and then, um, so yeah, but you, you then obviously uh, finally got to board your pride and joy in November. And then big question is, why did you need to do it in 90 days? Well, originally, yes, they use it for their few three boat shows it did. And the boat then was returned to a port called Port Grimaud near Saint Tropez in the Mediterranean. And that it was the end of October. That's at Coglin, isn't it? Coglin. Yeah, near Coglin, near Saint Tropez on that uh, um, um, Riviera coastline. And what happened? I looked at the weather patterns and the crossing seasons for, say, the Atlantic. And that sort of fell into place. We could get, if we could get out of the med, we could get in the Atlantic in the ideal season. And then we looked at this dream of doing the Pacific because the Atlantic, et cetera, we'd done that years ago. So we thought, no, let's, we can do it to the- um, And you do have to do it in season. Yeah, so the out. idea was that we could do this in season. And, and in the middle of that plan was our youngest daughter came up days before we left to go to Europe to pick the boat up. She said, oh, uh, my uh, partner That's and I have decided to get married on the 27th of December. Exciting news. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some exciting news. So uh, look, there was a lot of, uh, not pressure, but I mean, we thought, well, there was pressure. <laughs> and we, we wanted to get the boat, well, we wanted to get home for the wedding. So we got yeah. the boat to the Caribbean before Christmas. And that was how that worked. worked. out well. It worked out well. Uh, but there, yeah, it, and then the Pacific side, once you get through the Panama, uh, the crossing season is uh, February through to June, July, where you get the trade winds and you're out of the hurricane or sorry, cyclone season in the Southern Hemisphere. So it all fell into place. Uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, the hurricane season there is uh, through from, I've got a little note here, but it says it's from June to November. So yes. Uh, at the end of November, really, we were going to arrive in that area at the end of November, which we did. We left the, the Canaries mid-November, arriving in um, the Caribbean on the 16th. Actually, we left on the end of November. We got in on the 16th of December. It took us 16 days to sail across the Atlantic this time, which was reasonably fast. So, yes, it's, that, that all fell into place. And then the 90-day thing, well, that was driven wow. by... Yes, COVID-19. It fell into place <laughs> except for COVID-19 and Cyclone Harold. <laughs> they yeah. sort of uh, were the unknown factors that came to, into play. And with COVID-19, rather than being able to island hop and have a little look around and enjoy the Pacific that way, we were restricted. We were told we could only go to, to Tahiti, had to go to Papiete. And once we were there, we were confined to the dock. They were in complete lockdown. And uh, as it turned out, we were only there for three days. We refueled, replenished our food supply, and we took off and sailed all the way home to Southport in 27 days. Yeah, so the direction from the authorities there was we were not allowed to stop at any islands or any territories on the way home except for a dire emergency. So. Yeah, that was it. And we knew that there was also, uh, you can see this uh, note, Cyclone Harold. We knew that there was a low developing off uh, Solomon Islands, just north of uh, Vanuatu at that stage. And we had friends uh, based in Auckland, a friend there who was watching the weather patterns. Another gentleman at home here in Australia, a friend of ours. One in the US. One in the US of A. Another, this is one of our cruising friends that we met years ago. And the... Uh, and a gentleman on his confined to his 50 foot catamaran in uh, the isolation Anchorage area near the uh, airport at Papiete. So 
we had all these people helping us with these big weather pattern watch. So as we departed Tahiti, uh, it actually developed into a, an exercise of negotiating the cyclone, which worked out fine. We were fine. But, I remember uh, that that day because we got a uh, I got a message from my colleague in Tahiti saying, "Hey, I'm watching Gordon and Lou. That cyclone is going to cross their path. They don't seem to have taken any uh, avoidance yet." And then almost within an hour, you had turned around and you were heading northeast. Yeah. Well, yeah. fortunately, the the four people, the key four people, giving us advice, their advice was the same. All four of them said exactly the same. Head north, head north, head north. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, we, look, we were following and aware and, and that's what we did. And uh, the, weather pa the weather downloads you get and uh, the advice you can get these days is, is amazing. And yeah, so that was a very, very late in season cyclone too. Quite unusual actually. It was, you know, in the middle of April, which you expect it to be over by then. Marvellous that you can get communication like that across the oceans these days. It, um, mm. It's very reassuring. So before we go on to the next slide, there's just a couple of questions and I'd like to actually bring them now. Um, I think your next slide is about preparing for the journey, but there's just been a couple of sailing related questions. Good, yeah. Uh, so like if you don't to... mind, I'm just going to bring them to the table now. One is from Steve. He's just asked, how did you go with managing the chafing with the parasailer how you'd across the Atlantic? And did you run through any bad squalls at night with it up? <laughs> uh, yes, well, we did have the parasail up day and night. Um, <clears throat> we didn't have, managing the chafe every day, I would uh, adjust the position of all the sheets a little, um, just enough to take it away from the wear points on the pulley blocks. But we had, really no chafe actually and and that was up 16 days and nights and it was the only sail we came out of lanzarote with a nice uh, 12 knot nor'easter it was perfect for putting that sail up and we couldn't believe it this that breeze actually as you go down towards the verde islands you're heading down towards these lower latitudes that you get into these trade winds it just followed us and every time we you know we were curving our way across and then heading over and the breeze just sat behind us the whole way. So uh, we actually pulled that sail down heading into Lamar and at night time we were in 22 knots really and uh, it was a bit more wind that we'd have liked but a um, bit lively a bit lively as I called it. <laughs> <laughs> but we averaged uh, yeah we were um, averaging over eight knots on that trip. There were at, a couple of occasions with stronger breezes where we would let out the downhaul down hall, mm. and yes. once you do that it spills the air. And we'll come, we'll come later in the discussion to what happened across the Caribbean Sea. But for the Atlantic, yes, you carried the parasail of the whole way, yeah? We did. We did. And like Lou said, there are only a couple of squalls. We really had nice weather. So that's the importance of picking the right season to go across. Very consistent winds. Very consistent yeah, trade winds. Um, not many of those rain squalls, really. And, mm. and like Lou said, we just let the downhaul right out and the sail just flew up high at the bottom and it just dropped out the uh, you know but if you had line. decided on any of those nights because of the forecast or what the uh, information was that you should detune the boat at night time how, how hard or how easy is it to get the parasailer down and put it away um if you're watching your apparent into the sail and keep it around the 15 knots apparent it's all quite uh, doable we found and that was something we learned to manage as a couple as well but we had three we had uh, another person on board so um i we... think our choice of the size of the parasailer too um was was a choice that we made because it, we would often be just the two of us and we needed it to be easy to, to handle so we didn't get the parasailer there's three sizes you can go for we had yeah. the medium size or the small sorry the smaller size mm. so um and but we found it it's a very quite a powerful efficient sail and the the Elba and especially and the Helia, they sail very, very well downwind, uh, very fast boat. The Helia is so in your ten to for me to handle. Yeah. In your ten to fifteen knots of wind as you went across the Atlantic with your parasailer up, what sort of speeds were you uh, driving along at? Well, we that was the apparent wind we went up to, yes. but we were seeing breezes up to 20, 25 knots at times and 
we were averaging occasionally. Uh, occasionally we would get up to 14 uh, of knots, 15 knots boat speed, but mostly around the eight to 10 knots. Yes. And it sat on that constantly really. It was quite a constant speed we were doing. And that's with uh, the mainsail in the bag. Yes. Yep. Yes, we didn't, uh, the mainsail was used uh, in the med. We were on a reach virtually most of the time going across the Bay of Leon and what have you to get to Gibraltar. But uh, in the in the Atlantic, it was just the parasail. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. And then a um, couple of other questions just before we move on. Um, so the, there's a question again about your sail plan. So just before we move forward, so the Elba 45 was fitted with what sail wardrobe? Um, when we purchased the boat, it had the main and the head sail and or Genoa. And also if you go on their uh, promotional, promotional video, video, which is on the Fontaine Peugeot website link, you'll see the beautiful big red Jenica with a 45 on it. Yes, and that was our uh, that was our other sail in the wardrobe. We Plus, enjoyed that sail, beautiful. Yeah, that was our preference in the Pacific. But um, we then put on the extra winch and uh, blocks, etc., fittings to have the parasail, and that was something yes. we purchased for our departure. Yes. Okay. And then final one uh, before we move on. As a new boat, how did you find raising and dropping the Elba's mainsail? Any difficulties up or down? No, no not beautiful. at all. I, I think the carver hook system works exceptionally well and it's easy to manage. It's very smooth. Very smooth operation. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's a very easy sail to uh, pull up and down. And uh, look, the, the Fontaine bridge deck uh, helming and winch and all your sheeting, it just makes life so easy to manage mm -hmm. and, and set up your reefing to manage all your sail settings, etc. It's a It's a, a very easy boat to manage. The boom's not that high that you can't get into the bag. It's nicely positioned. But it's yeah, I noticed on the weekend that it's almost like, for me, I'm six foot. It was at around about just below chest height. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's quite easy to manage. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so we'll keep moving along now, but that was just some questions that had been uh, presented. So I thought it would, uh, uh, and then we've got a, um, a couple more questions. So I'll go a bit further and then we'll stop and do some more. So, okay. okay. Okay, so now we're getting on to how you prepared your Elba for the long passage. Yeah, because um, we knew perfectly well that we were going to have very long passages for this journey. Um, but the first thing I think everyone who's picking up a boat in, uh, in the Med, they need to think about things like... Or from uh, France. Yeah. And, or from France. Um, preparing your personal matters at home, your finances, your bills, wills, power of attorney, um, electoral role, and your mail and healthcare. They're just some of the things that you really have to give some thought to before you leave home. Uh, but something else too, that I was very conscious of was talking to the family. Um, I think it's important that you communicate to those loved ones around you and that, you know, why you're doing it. What, what, what's your passion and um, explain your desire in, in taking off for months on end. Was there uh, a level of anxiety in those people? Yeah, I think there uh, Initially was. there was, in, yeah, there was with yeah. Lou's mum and dad initially yeah. when we did the Helia. I remember feeling that with, with my parents, that there was a level of anxiety, but after the first season and we came home, I sat with mum and she said, Lou, I get it now. We've been able to share this journey with you through all of your posts and posts in um, Facebook. And I get it now. You must be so excited about going back for your second <laughs> season. So that was um, wonderful to me that I, I felt she had given me her blessing. Which It's was that old saying, isn't it? The fear of the unknown. If we can remove the unknown, we remove the fear. Yeah, yeah. And for our daughters, it was wonderful to see them. I mean, they're all adults now, but just lovely to see their relationships. Um, you know, they pulled together when we, we weren't here. Uh, they pulled together and supported one another. And they actually blossomed, we feel, very much so. Yes, that was... Whilst we were away, they, uh, uh, they became wonderful adults and uh, very responsible. It, it was great. <laughs> 
And then you've said there the old KISS principle. What's that in relation to? Yeah. Um, well, well, the setup of the boat, for a start, we didn't want to put too many fancy uh, pieces on the boat. It was just, we were happy to accept the, the stand, their setup for their boat show setup. Um, we added a water maker and a, and, and a washing machine. That was primarily to give us the freedom to, 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 to do all this long distance transiting. But yeah, Lou, Lou will explain about the outfitting, keeping it I simple. I think from my point of view too, when it came to outfitting the boat, um, we wanted to just be practical with basics. In fact, for us, we knew that we had all the gear from the previous boat in our garage ready to be placed on our new boat. But even for those people who are doing factory pickups, uh, if you can keep it simple, it's just a joy as you travel through the med uh, and around the world, everywhere you go, you can gather bits and pieces which become mementos and um, souvenirs, uh, but also as, um, you know, fashion, pieces and um, decorating your boat. It's funny you say that because a few weeks ago we had the webinar with Michael and Marita Lysard who have the Let's Dance Sailing and they said almost exactly the same thing and, oh. and in their case because it was their first time they, mm. they realised that they probably went with too much to start with. Right. Yes. Right. Well you end up with you know things like a Moroccan rug. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and you know you can overthink a boat too in the setup of the actual physical uh, items on a boat that you use it it, it doesn't have you don't have to have everything these boats will manage quite simply in their basic setup and and yes you'll gather things as you go in the med the med is a, a very safe and, and uh user friendly, user -friendly area mm -hmm. to manage and, and set up complete the setup of your boat as you go and that's doable you know it's not um it's not a difficult thing. So keeping it simple. And, just, with, mm. and just to touch base, so let's just run through it. So that Elba 45 uh, was, uh, you had the gen set, you've had water maker. Uh, Washing machine. You had, you had AC. Yes. So we've got the boat itself set up with uh, a generator because the company, when they use it as a display model, they like to display with the air conditioning, etc. So this boat does have air conditioning. Um, and but I did hear you say the other day that maybe if, if you had bought the boat using your own spec, you wouldn't have chosen it. But now that you've been sailing with it for three months, you would always tick it again. I love it. I don't we think I'll have it. a boat yes. without it. Yeah. <laughs> <Again>. <laughs> and, and this beautiful boat comes with a platform, of course. That's yeah. uh, an option which uh, I think it, it, it just makes the boat grow in that it's got so many uses that platform for your tender for uh, the grandkids to sit on or for people who dive to launch off with their tanks on um, getting oldies on and off the boat putting your luggage and shopping on and off and things like that so the platform i think we haven't used it much i must admit but we look yes. forward to that um, that photograph there, you'll see we're just positioning the tender onto the platform. Um, one funny point, Greg, and, and for those listening, that tender did not go in the water between France and Australia. <laughs> and we'll and, come to that. That had, might have something to do with COVID. <laughs> yes, I think that's what caused that. But anyway, look, at set up was the washing machine, the generator. It's got the standard factory solar. You do need that. You need the solar panels. A minimum is that 400 gives you a starting point uh, for cruising though uh, the way we were living aboard I would probably double that minimum or add a little more uh, you can do that also after market um, we had the freezer the 90 litre freezer the refrigerator on this boat is just amazing it, it, it's a 130 litre two drawer fridge refrigerator and when we were crossing from Panama to Tahiti, that was a 35 day passage and we didn't get the trade winds we were expecting. Louise was still pulling fresh veggies out of that yeah. drawer after 35 days. Mandarins, crisp apples. Beautiful. So That's amazing. very good. Yeah. So listen, I, it's my fault. I took you off course there. So we'll come back <laughs> to the document. <laughs> That's okay. So we're down to communications. Yeah, the comms on this boat, we've got the standard BHF, 
um, system on the boat. I've got a, a, a standby handheld VHF I use as well as a backup in case we throw it in the grab bag. Um, but we also have an Iridium Go system on board, which gave us the ability to uh, email and keep in touch with all our family and friends. Uh, you could also uh, we you could also text, and you can also talk. You can uh, make phone calls, and we did have phone calls on the way across. We also use that for our weather downloads, etc. So that's an important thing: using having it, a good communication system on board. Yeah, using it for weather and just text. I mean, it's quite inexpensive, isn't it? It only becomes expensive if you're doing actual phone. Uh, voice phone voice communication that does add up a little yeah. more on your billing, but. Uh, the other was an un, what they call an unlimited uh, plan we had, and that works fairly well. Uh, okay. Navigation. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yep, Greg. Keep going. Sorry. Yep. I was going to go on to the nav charts now, if you want. Uh, the navigation yes. charts. We had what they call um, passage planning charts from Imray. Uh, we didn't have detailed close in charting. We were relying on our, um, we had Navionics on our iPad. Um, that was a, a really useful tool. Actually, we had two iPads we had on board. Uh, and then you've got your Garmin charts in your plotter. And the options there are to go with a worldwide card or individual cards for different areas. And I went for the individual cards because they actually do give more detail when you get into port, whereas a worldwide uh, card, it, it, it gives you some detail, but it's not as detailed into port, into river mouths, into bays, etc. Some of that isn't on the big uh, worldwide card. And we purchased those cards before we left Australia. So we got all those through a, uh, I don't know if we should say the name, Whitworth's here, but uh, we purchased the cards here and took those away. We're not us. the ABC, you can say whatever you like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, safety gear, well, we. Look, you can go online and you can get a lot of information on safety gear, but for us, we had yes. uh, the offshore cruise saver, Ergo Fit, they call it, 190N uh, offshore life vest, which we find so comfortable That's to wear, yeah. very, very comfortable, plus a personal AIS on those as well. Uh, we've, we, our, our thinking that was the AIS is probably something other boats in the area, but a ship, whatever, can find you, rather than a personal um, EPIRB. We do have the normal EPIRB as well on board. Um, but look, there's a list, of, a huge list of items you can select for your first aid and safety gear that you'll carry on board. And I can make up a, a list, but you'll find that also online in various Excellent. places. Um, Lou put together our medical kit. Yeah, and uh, just to, to mention about um, medical needs to consider that when you are uh, preparing for a trip like this. Um, if you have any prescriptions, you need to get those filled before you leave Australia and make sure you have plenty of, of medicines to see you through. And when it came to the first aid kit, we already had a quite a comprehensive first aid kit that we put together for um, our Helia 44. Our beautiful daughter, Amanda, who uh, is a nurse, and Gordon's brother, who's a doctor, they both helped to advise us. Plus we of course, looked online and um, and found lots of helpful lists, etc. Um, my feeling was that I wanted to outfit our first aid kit with all the items so that I knew what was there and I knew how to how use, to use them. Mm -hmm. um, that was just the way I wanted to do it. But there are other ways to do it. Of course, there's uh, things that you can purchase already packed up. Uh, but in the webinar on the 28th of August, no doubt, Greg, you'll have yes. lots of helpful yes. information for people there. Yeah. Yep. And then um, and then just jumping down, pre predict wind and provisioning. Yeah, well, the Iridium Go system and the predict wind sort of work together. And the predict wind is a, a New Zealand based uh, company who uh, supply you with your weather grids and data. And there are various plans for that. And we went with a professional uh, one that gave you a lot of um, information as well. So it just made sure we were covered with every possibility with our weather, what, what we could source from these weather uh, through Predict Wind. Provisioning was Louise's expertise, ex <laughs> forte. She well, was... <laughs> um, the way that I like to do it, uh, and I know some people are 
far more precise. I actually, actually do meal planning and <laughs> spreadsheets and things like that. But for me, I just roughly calculate how many meals I estimate we would need on passage um, and then have make sure that I have ready-made meals that are easy to, to produce if the weather is rough. And then of course have lots of extra. So lots of your um, long life products, uh, dry goods, your rice, pasta, lentils and things. And, um, and of course, uh, canned and bottled bits and pieces. On the Elba 45, I've got to say, the storage area is amazing. The five mm. compartments under the floor, I used mainly for those dry goods and, um, and extra bits and pieces. And all the cupboards in the, the galley, it just made it so easy to store everything. And of course, as Gordon said, the huge fridge, freezer, and we've got the bar fridge out in the uh, cockpit as well. So it wasn't an effort at all uh, to find places for all of these bits and pieces. And I, we had enough food that I was confident to get through the long passages. In fact, our passage from Panama to Tahiti was 35 days. And I said to the boys, you know, if ever you get to the stage where you, you, you're eating rice with hot sauce for breakfast, you'll know that we're in trouble. But we never- You avoided scurvy. <laughs> And Greg, just so I want to correct uh, from a previous webinar, the fishing rod did catch fish. Oh, yes. <laughs> and listen, we're just about to move on because we're, uh, we're, yes. we're taking time. But uh, I've got a question there from Rod uh, about contingency planning. Great question, Rod. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move on for now and then we'll cover that in the Q&A at the end because it's a good question. I can tell sure. that Gordon and Lou might take a while to answer it. So we'll... Uh, but we'll keep moving for now. So now let's talk about the trip, the places you visited. Okay, well, this uh, you can see the images there. That was around uh, Port Grimaud or, or Coghlan. And uh, that image there with Louise on the left is looking out the bay that crossed to Saint-Tropez. So that's where we started our trip. Yeah. The boat was lifted out there for... Pretty area. Yeah, very pretty. And that was when it was lifted out for the fittings, through hull fittings for our... Um, washing machine and water maker actually, yeah. So that was our first, that was our departure port. And we left there in early November with ice on the deck. That's how oh, cold it, it was. It was very cold. It was very cold. <laughs> November's not the right time to be cruising in the Med itself. And when we left uh, Coglin, our intention was to get to Gibraltar, but uh, because of uh, the strong winds. An unforecast gale warning actually through the Gibraltar, yeah. through the Straits of Gibraltar. We ducked into Ibiza and that's um, an island in the Balearic Islands and normally that place is absolutely pumping. It's known for its nightlife, its bars and shops and things and we've been there in the high season. It, it was absolutely fantastic but seeing it like this, the place was deserted. It was eerie. <laughs> was eerie. It was still beautiful, but um, very eerie. And we enjoyed a good couple of days there just to rest up before we continued on to Gibraltar. So the next stop then, we moved on to Gibraltar. Uh, that's so where just we... before we go to Gibraltar, I'll ask a question. Lou, you've got all your, um, your long johns on there in the sleeping bag. How did, you, <laughs> I... how did you find the temperature inside the boat and how did you find the humidity? Well, um, the temperature outside was just so jolly cold. Inside, we had the... Um, air conditioning. <laughs> yeah, the comfort of the air conditioning when we turned it on. Um, if we had helm, the generator running. Yeah. yeah, our helm position, we had the bimini with the clears around it, which is a great protection in weather yes. like that. Um, yes, but we certainly had our thermals and wet weather gear on for warmth during that period. It was very cold <laughs> up there, yeah. It was, it was their winter, coming on to their winter, well and yeah. truly. But inside the, the um, catamaran was lovely. We've also got the comfort of, of um, carpet in the hulls, which is lovely. Yes. When you get out of bed and you've got comfort, uh, the carpet, carpet under, your, under feet. your feet, it's nice. 
So we'll move on from there and then off you pop to Gibraltar. 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 So we sailed in there to pick up our, our, our extra crew person to do the Atlantic and Steve joined us there. We stayed at La Linea, which is on the Spanish side. It's just over the runway. But you can walk across from where we were into Gibraltar and that's where we did our shopping. And Gibraltar had this <laughs> It was the most amazing English supermarket, but just supermarket on steroids it really was and what mm. Every, yeah. everywhere we went there were fabulous um supermarkets where you could purchase all of your needs uh, i think that's important to say to people that uh provisioning yeah. the boat isn't isn't hard and it, gibraltar is also tax-free so uh, filling your boat up with fuel had a, a yeah, it wasn't quite a, a big hit into the back hip pocket. So you walk, that's the runway, you're crossing over, you just walk over the runway. It's quite strange. Uh, mm. to look left, look, look right, and then look left again, and off you go. But no, not quite. They've got boom gates that come down. <laughs> <laughs> um, after Gibraltar, our next stop was Lanzarote. Lanzarote is um, an island in the Canary Islands. It's uh, Spanish, and it's well known for its all all year round warm weather. Um, it's quite a spectacular island. As you approach, you can see the, the lunar landscape. It's all volcanic yeah, and right. quite, quite strange. To, to and where, what was your weather like by the time you got there temperature wise? So that was in November, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, it was starting to warm up by the time we got to the Canary Islands. 22 degrees, Greg. Yeah. It was up around the 20s, early 20s. And the water temperature too had gone up to about 17 degrees by then too. So, and, and were you then immersed in a cruising family there? Was there a lot of other cruising boats on the same track as you? Yes. There certainly was. Mm -hmm. uh, at the marina we were on, it was, there. there yes, there were uh, many, many boats that were there waiting to do the Atlantic uh, crossing because the November departure is, mid-November is very popular. Some of them were doing it <coughs> with rallies with uh in company with other boats and then we met other people who were doing the same as us uh, on our own, on our own. Mm. and i noticed your track from gibraltar down to the canaries you went really quite close to the uh, moroccan coast there did you therefore come across fishing traffic and and other boats we certainly did <laughs> much to the a surprise of our guest on board who was helping us because uh, it used to spook him a little at night seeing all these fishing boats and lights but look they all had uh, their lights and bits on and we were far enough offshore to to miss the bulk of them but we were surprised to see these little dow type tenders type boats they'd be 20 miles offshore yeah. and, and and they were catching these big sailfish and uh, we were they'd hold these massive fish up you know six foot they like uh, to show many, them all. showing off their catch, <laughs> these fellows. And uh, no, we passed uh, quite a few boats, but everything was well lit up at night. You, you couldn't, uh, you wouldn't hit anyone. And we didn't have any nets or boys or, or any traps out there that would catch you. And speaking of night passages, uh, we had a roster system where we did three hours on and each. So it gave you three hours on and six hours off with three of us. Ah, so that was one of the questions that I was holding over. So now's uh -huh. the time to ask that. So um, David asked, hi Gordon and Lou, what sailing roster did you have on your long passages with the three of you? Mm. Well, we used to have, every evening we got into a routine with, um, we used to have a sip of uh, something <laughs> on the, what we call the Stardust Lounge. It's got the most beautiful lounge deck above the roof of the, uh, the Elba. And we'd look through, because we were heading west all the time, so always looking into the sun virtually, and we'd sit down and have a drink, talk the day through, Dinner was early. Lou would do the eight till 11 shift. Um, our other crew member would do the 11 till two, and I always did the two till five. And that worked really well. Louise would come up early in the morning and take over and I'd go back and get another hour's sleep. But, um, and that was a routine we kept up the whole way. We never changed that routine. That, it, it made it a lot easier to manage. Very good. Mm. And then um, you left Lanzarote. You, uh, uh, you put your uh, parasailer up, as you said. You sailed for a few weeks and off you popped into, uh, oh, hang on. Well, yeah, <laughs> then we arrived in Martinique. And that in Martinique. We went, 
Yeah, the Port of Lamarin, which is on the southern end of uh, Martinique. <clears throat> That's a rugged Caribbean island. It's part of the Lesser Antilles in the middle or towards the southern part of the Caribbean island chain. Very hot and humid. So as we came down into the lower latitudes towards uh, Martinique, and it's at about 13 or 14 degrees of latitude, it, it, the water temperature was 28 degrees and the air temperature wasn't much different and very humid then when we got there. But Lamar, and as you can see from that image, it, it's a yachting paradise and a lot of catamarans. It, its main industry is tourism and charters. So um, it's, it's very a pretty, very pretty, pretty very island. pretty island. Very lush. Mm. So just looking at the two of you sitting there looking at that chart, just going back to that watch keeping system, so um, how many hours of, of on watch time were you having each per day? Um, during the day, we, we, didn't we didn't stick to a routine at all in the daytime. Daytime was like, if you felt like sitting at the helm and keeping an eye on things with the autopilot, we were using wind angle. Yes. And we didn't, the autopilot is the hardest crew member, working crew member on your boat. And this autopilot on this boat is just phenomenal. And that, that was part of the routine during the day. You could relax and, and move around and do what you wish, read and listen to music or play cards and do what we were doing during the day. But it was at night with two people asleep that you would always have somebody just monitoring on watch at the helm. So during the day, yeah, it, it's hard to tell. Some days yes. you would be up there if you had weather around that you worry about. Otherwise, yeah, it was pretty relaxed during the day. Very good. And then the Panama. Now, oh, we, yes. we might, just before we get to the Panama, is there anything you want to tell us about the crossing? <laughs> <laughs> You're a meanie, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, so we how have, long from Martinique to Panama? It's 1,200 Colorado. nautical miles. Yes. And it, it started out as a very comfortable departure out of Martinique and we decided to put our parasail up again. The conditions were ideal for that. Um, and we were doing our intonight sailing, but we were being quite cautious. There was an area above Venezuela and it's what they call a confluence of currents down there. It's a very, the sea can become quite lumpy and confused and not being au fait with their weather patterns around there. We did have a weather report for the area and it was forecasting favourable winds that we could continue sailing the way we were with our sail set up. But unfortunately, we went to, uh, went to, had our evening meal and yeah, we were on our first watch into the evening and the breeze just kept building instead of dropping as it was forecast. And we ended up with this parasail. Um, we couldn't get it down. <laughs> yeah. And we were doing 20 knots. So the boat was, very safe. It was actually handling it very well, but the sail didn't in the end. So we had a little issue with our sail, which we've since had repaired and we've got that back on dock, but that was something that happened. And uh, that was a bit of a, a, a wake up and a learning curve for us. We sort of realized that we shouldn't be using that sail in those conditions at that, with those breezes. So that was a, a, a hard, expensive lesson, or well, it wasn't that expensive, but it was a lesson. So ha not having that across the Pacific, were there times when you went, oh, gee, I wish the parasailer was working today or? Uh, well, to be honest, no. It, well, we did say that, but then we realised the performance we were getting out of the boat, uh, out of the sail we had up uh, with this yes. beautiful Jenica. The boat speeds we were seeing were, were similar, very similar with the main and the Jenny. So it, it, would, well, it, it wasn't something we missed in the end. We actually came to love that Jenica. Okay. So, yeah. And now I think this is a part of your presentation that a lot of people are interested in. You, you've done the Panama Canal. So. Yeah. And it was fascinating. It, um, it was very warm weather when we were going through and uh, we went through the old locks. So to go through the Panama Canal and, and the Panama Canal connects the Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific Ocean. You go through three locks up to the level of uh, an inland freshwater lake and then on the other side go down three locks to the ocean uh, level. 
what are those pictures we're seeing on the screen now? Okay, so initially when you go in, we went into Shelter Bay, which is the entrance at the Atlantic side, and you end up, we'd all arrange an agent to look after our transit, which expedited our transit to the point where we were arrived at the marina on one day and three days later we were heading off through the canal. So that is a plus. That's something people should consider when they're going into the Panama to have an agent expedite. Otherwise you'll spend two to three weeks waiting to get a clearance through the canals. Um, you have a pilot, so you go out and wait and the pilot comes on board. We were extremely lucky in that we had a pilot come on board at 5.30 in the morning and he got off on the Pacific side at 6 p.m. in the afternoon. So we did a total day transit, which is very rare. Um, so what you do, you come into the lock system. We were in behind a huge freighter and then they had a tug uh, that was operating, working with this freighter and watching the freighter. So we actually tied up alongside the tug and that made our transit through the canal, uh, through the um, locks much easier. We didn't have to catch these. Yeah. Uh, lines from the, the dock and we felt uh, very safe <clears throat> so we that made our transit up and and the down transit at the other end that image is us coming out on the Pacific side and that's called the America Bridge and that links um, the Panama to the Americas it's a it's a giant road bridge that goes across the uh, waterway on the canal transit on the exit on the other side so how many um, rope handlers came on board uh, with with the your guide? We, we had our own. We had uh, yes. four people. Oh, that was myself and Louise. Five of us. Yeah, there were five of us on board. So yes. one person for each corner. But so we you, didn't you, need them. From Martinique to uh, Panama, you took an extra two people with you, that, that friends of yours, yes? Correct, yes. They were American couple that wanted to experience uh, some sailing on a catamaran. Well, we gave them a lively experience on that. And <laughs> they wanted to experience the Panama they transit. <laughs> yeah, they loved it. Actually, they've ordered a catamaran. They're buying a catamaran. They live in Chesapeake Bay. But that, that meant that you then didn't need any of the, the local rope handlers on your no. boat. You just you just had so you just had one one um, person on board? The yeah. pilot, that's all. He he's an advisor, they call him, and he doesn't steer or or control the boat as such, he just instructs. Uh, and that blue line you can see up the front under Phil's feet, that was one of the four lines that they actually, uh, the agent supplies, you rent those from, from him for the day and for the transit. And he supplies the fenders also. He's got these huge ball fenders that they give you as well. So you end up protected and you have your lines on board before you go into the lock. So that was January, yes? Uh, no, that uh, February, early February. Yes. Uh, I was just trying to think, it was around about the 14th or 15th of Feb? Yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, early Feb, middle February we did that. And we came out on the other side. We had two nights, three nights on the, in the marina there to restock our boat and um, just uh, gather ourselves. And then the American couple went home and then Phil, Louise and I then did the uh, rest of the Pacific transit. And did you go ashore in Panama City? Yes, oh yes, 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 we went into town. But that was at the beginning, very, very early stages then of COVID too. What They hadn't been affected there and the world was... There was no lockdown, but people were being very cautious. They were reacting to it. masks were being worn. Yeah, so things were starting to happen then. And we were aware of, you know, that this was a, a bad, well, we thought just then a flu bug, I suppose, going around, but it, it turned into more than that, obviously, yeah. Uh, very good. So I'll flick to the next page. Um, so we've, we're through the Panama. If anyone's got any questions on the Panama transit, uh, let us know. We can answer those at the end. And then um, this was supposed to be the great, the, the great adventure, wasn't it? You were going to, yes. in a leisurely way, cruise across the Pacific and visit all those beautiful, pristine beaches and islands. And um, that didn't happen. No, we had our snorkeling gear ready and never got wet. <laughs> so that, that image there in the main picture is in the middle is uh, Maria. And yes. that was from, uh, as we entered uh, the, that was in Tahiti. So, uh, and the other images uh, on the left is, uh, that's in town. We were on a dock near the passenger terminal actually. And yeah, original Tahiti plan, was disappointing. Original, 
your original yeah. plan was to stop in the Marquesas, yeah? Yes, yes. And then we, we received instruction uh, en route that we couldn't do that. We had to go directly to Papiate and uh, yes, we were in our little parallel universe. That's when all that uh, COVID uh, lockdown started after we passed the Galapagos Islands. It, it really changed and, uh, and that's when our plans changed. We realised that this was now going to be a delivery, a fast delivery back home to Australia. And, and Phil, our crew member there, he was also, he was on his own. His wife was at home coping with what was happening with this COVID um, issue. And he was concerned for his family. So we just wanted to get, keep moving if we could and get home in that stage. A lot of uncertainty at that time for everyone. It was a very interesting exercise, Greg, managing um, the emotional, the side, emotional side, as side as well as, as everything else. And yeah. But, you know, in the end, we we're on a beautiful, comfortable boat and uh, we were provisioning ourselves with a few fish, etc. And oh. we, we were living a, a really comfortable, happy life on the boat. But we knew what was unfolded yeah. at home. We, we said how lucky we were, really. It's, uh, yeah. In a sense. Mm. So but did one, you go close enough to the Galapagos to see them? No. In the end, no. And uh, we end up in the doldrums, actually, <laughs> down that area. So it, yeah, that was interesting. We decided that that's, we just wouldn't go into the Galapagos. Unfortunately, we felt that that was going to delay our transit as well with everything else closing down around us. So we kept moving. And, and you know, we passed some beautiful atolls around as we came down in towards Tahiti, Papiato, just beautiful. And we just thought, oh, why can't we stop? And oh, that, that would have been the Tuamotus, as you were Yes, Tuamotus. Oh, yeah. they, they were some beautiful islands in there and atolls that really are gorgeous. And, and we'll go back again one day. I don't know if we'll sail out there, but we'll go back and explore there too. And that shot there looks like a, a shot of, of Tahiti and Morea, is it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's right. And the other is of the dock uh, near the dock, or well, the dock area we were, and it was a beautiful clubhouse and everything, but it was all closed. The yeah. whole town was shut down in in a sense. The only thing open was the pharmacy, the hospital, and the um, uh, supermarkets, and that was it. And there was no alcohol. You couldn't buy. <laughs> we couldn't restock our our little supply of our. Uh, our tipple that we'd have every evening as we get ready for dinner. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it was quite a shock. So going back to that crossing from uh, Panama to Tahiti, obviously you weren't able to stop in the places you wanted. But what about uh, traffic? What about sea life? What, what, what was the experience like? Uh, well, it was a bit eerie, actually. There um, was no traffic. There was no traffic. Yeah, it was... Uh, very quite, different to the Atlantic. Quite odd. Because mm. we, we had a lot of traffic. We saw a lot of sailboats on the Atlantic side. But mm. the Pacific, that part of it was, there was nothing. Not a boat. And... It was sea life. Sea, no. sea life, mainly flying fish. Mainly flying, flying fish. <laughs> yeah. And big tuna, Greg, as you saw in that image. We caught some huge tuna, but I just didn't want to bring them on board the boat. They were too big. No, they were too big to land. But we did catch uh, some mahi-mahi and, and other fish. But... And, and smaller tuna. And were um, there old colleagues of yours flying overhead? Did you see many planes? No, we didn't see no. much. At, oh, there was the odd, but at night time you could see their lights, but there was only one or two aircraft the whole way. Uh, we just didn't see any traffic in the sky either. Yes, far less than we would have expected. Because mm. mm. arriving in Tahiti, two days later, they all flights were, that was it. There was no more flights in or out two days after our arrival. Yeah. So it was very interesting exercise, actually. <laughs> Eerily quiet everywhere, in the mm. skies and on the streets, in the, on, on the water. Mm. And, the boat, and the boat performed well across there in terms of mechanically and, and, and so yes. on? Yes, yeah. very well. And this boat, actually, it performs exceptionally well downwind, the beam winds, even uh, a, a tight reach really like it really it's typical of a cruising cat into wind which we weren't experiencing anyway but it sails extremely well off the wind and and downwind it's a very very fast boat and quite stable and it's got this i call it a soft ride it's got this amazing um ride through all swell and chop conditions that was different to the other cats we've been sailing on 
and extremely comfortable. It was really is a comfortable boat. Yeah, mm. The other feature too we felt was that when when a breeze came up, you could feel the boat take off. Mm. It yeah. just came to life very, very uh, quickly. But even yeah. light, light breezes, it, it, it did sail extremely well. It's quite... The performance was quite impressive, actually. Yeah. So not a scary tenderness, but a, enough tenderness to tell you what it's doing. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we'll click across. So then you left Tahiti after a two-day stopover. Um, you probably, what, had about 12 hours of land under your legs, and then off you went again. And that was the interesting leg later on, because the, uh, the, uh, we had that cyclone in front of us, which we were preparing for one of those images there is showing of the, the spiraling cloud masses that follow the trail of a cyclone and you can see that and that was um the sea state wasn't too bad though we ended up no. in some biggish swells but they're all smooth big swells it was very manageable um so what about and, the cook islands and tonga which which did you go to the north of both of those groups Yes, we did, and we we sort of cut through the Tongan group a little, but it was quite up high, uh, quite high. We were heading at that stage maybe to go closer to Fiji, but in the end we end up coming down below the islands of Fiji. But, so you went uh, south of Vavahu, did you? Yes. Okay, so you would have gone quite close to the volcano. Ah, yes, and that was one of the features of interesting events. Uh, that was something that loomed up out of the horizon one morning and it was the sun was behind so we were sailing west sun had risen behind and and i could see this mass in front i thought it was a big cruise ship this white shape and i thought oh is it either that or it's a naval vessel and then it would disappear and i just keep staring a bit and i <laughs> wonder what on earth was happening and i got lou to come up and we were looking at the chart plotter and it has showed you these islands, but we didn't realise it was an active volcano. <laughs> and we thought it was actually an island birthing, you know, like they talk about this happening in the open seas at times when the volcanic uh, event and, and an island appears. And that's what happened. This island appeared in 1954, I think it was. Yes. And it's still, it's just fuming and, and, and venting a bit. And, and it was quite a, neat, a strange sight. It was yeah. spectacular. That was quite yeah. an event. <laughs> and did you come across any, any of the pumice floats no. that were out there? No. No, yeah. we didn't see that, thank goodness. Mm. It scratched the hull, Greg. We didn't want to Yes. Mark. <laughs> so, okay, so you, you, you scrape uh, past the Cook Islands, past Tonga, and then set a course towards Fiji. Yes, and, and we... At that stage, the weather patterns were quite favourable. So we were sailing on wind angles, et cetera. And with the Jenica. And with the Jenica during the day. And we'd furl it. We had a 12 knot apparent trigger point for that, to furl that and go back to the Genoa. And we flew the Genoa at night. So the main and the Genoa at night. So the mainsail never came down across the Pacific, really. It, it stayed up. We did reef it, but it stayed... Um, it stayed up most of uh, well, the whole trip. And just Being before up, we get to Australia, if you go back to the cyclone experience, even though you didn't go near the eye of the cyclone, I, I think the, 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 my understanding is you did get quite a bit of wind and, and sea activity off it, yeah? Yes, we did. And one stage we were heading um, away from our track, or in other words, or away from Australia. We were heading back towards the east and... We, that was a stage when it was still quite windy and rough, but we didn't want to go any further east. We just felt we had to sort of rest or, or stop somehow. And it was actually in the middle of the night. So all the sails were dropped, everything stopped. Phil was actually asleep during this event. And Louise and I then just lit the boat and it sat side on to the swell and the wind and it all became very quiet and calm. So we went to bed and slept. We slept solidly for the next four, four or five hours. Mm. And poor Phil came up, <laughs> thought we'd jump ship. He, he, <laughs> he got the fright of his life because he had slept through the whole event and woke up later at like six o'clock in the morning and wondered where on earth we were. <laughs> I, I remember seeing that on your tracker because it was like someone had just started squiggling a little line on the page. It was like, it's like whoa, what's going on out there? That was yeah. us. <laughs> yeah, so that was that was an interesting exercise, and we've never done that before. 
and and and, and also Phil, and it gave him a, a, it was an interesting event for for all of us. We learnt an appreciation of just how what you can do. Yeah, yeah, how um, very good. So then you you were lucky because I always think that one of the the, the most difficult areas to cross is that area from uh, New Mir or, or New Cal or across to the Australian coast, across the, the Coral Sea and the South Pacific there. So you had a, again, you had a pretty good weather window, didn't you? We did, but uh, unfortunately we did have another weather event that came up behind us and we, we knew it was there and it was going to sort of track in behind and disappear to the south. But, and we thought we'd outrun this uh, pattern and it, it snuck up on us during the night and it did blow for quite a while. We had the sails reefed down, right down, and the boat was handling it beautifully though. We were doing 14 knots and tracking. The boat actually does perform exceptionally well in, in all these sea states. Like I said, the hull design on this boat is quite, it's very clever. Whatever Olivia has done um, has worked. This is a new underwater hull design on this boat as well as the new Allegra 67 cat as well. So it's an exceptionally, uh, yeah, it's a great improvement. But and the then you came to the Australian coastline. Yeah. And all of a sudden there was humans. Yes, yes. Um, well, the familiar, you know, shape of that coastline was, was very welcome. And uh, you know how people say that when you reach land, you can smell land. Coming to the Australian coastline, we could smell home and uh, we told each other that it was because of the eucalypt. But anyway, <laughs> it was uh, it was an exciting time. Yeah, and it was interesting, uh, an interesting exercise again, just getting back into Australia with the COVID situation there. Yes, normally you, you have to um, go alongside the quarantine dock and be be uh, cleared in but this time of course with COVID it was even more stringent and uh, mm. we felt like we were very much uh, in on focus yeah because you know hmm? mm. no, so you, you were even famous weren't you wasn't there television crews waiting for you yeah that was our next door neighbor, our lovely good friend next door neighbor who organized that but he was so <laughs> excited about our return he he had been following us because Part of the predict wind um, system you have on this iridium is also a tracking uh, system as well. You can send out, it sends out your position and your friends and family, et cetera, can follow you. So we were posting every day on this tracking system with Lou would put together these little blogs every day. And it became a routine for most people at home that were following us to get up in the morning with their cup of coffee and read the story. So Stuart had become so enthused with all this that he got in touch with Channel 7 and said, can you go and meet these guys? It's a good news story. So that's what yes. happened with the TV. And that program. was right in the middle of the, the, the worst part of COVID, wasn't it? Yes. And, and we thought having done 27 days in isolation at sea on our boat <laughs> would be enough to allow us to drive home. But uh, it wasn't to be. We were put into isolation into a hotel by the government Queensland Government Health uh, up there, which was fair enough, everyone was that were coming in. And we managed to negotiate through um, a dispensation. We, we went online and applied and were given a clearance to return after three days, which, which was- As it terrific. turned out, I think three days in the hotel was rather nice. Just perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and Gordon, Gordon, how many books did you read on the trip, mate? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd bring that up, Greg. Um, I had uh, three books. I had proper <laughs> hard copy, and I thought I had my old, um, I had two Kindles. One's a new one, and one's an older one, which is loaded up with a lot of books, the old one. The new one only had a few books in it, and unfortunately, I only had the new, new one with me. So I missed out on my reading. I did, I missed that. Yeah, I, I, I was well prepared, Greg. <laughs> Before leaving Australia, I had made sure that I had lots of books on um, on my iPod downloaded and also lots of podcasts. And uh, that kept me happy, especially doing at my three hour shift at night. I actually looked forward to it because it was my time. I put one earplug in, only one, because the other ear was listening out for anything that was happening on the boat. And I would listen to the most fascinating 
stories, uh, I would listen to music, and I had loads and loads of books <laughs> downloaded. I was prepared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a great image of uh, Anna uh, Wallace. She's a, a great uh, a support in the Multi Health Solutions Group, and she supplied us in our COVID uh, encased hotel there. She came in with a lovely sample pack. Uh, courtesy of Multi Health Solutions, which was gracefully received. We couldn't see her. <laughs> she only dropped it at the hotel, but of course, waved out the window. She phoned, and we managed to wave to her from the dizzying heights of the, our <laughs> hotel room. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going back. So there's the hotel room pack. Yes, yes, yes. that was it. Well, that was the uh, pack that Multi Health supplied. Yes, yeah. and it was wonderful. Very really thoughtful. <laughs> so um, I'll just put you on pause for a minute there, Gordon and Lou, and I'll just talk to all of our uh, participants, the people who've been in listening to this. It's amazing to see how everyone has stayed on. Um, if you've got any questions, now's the time to ask because we're uh, coming to the end of this uh, presentation for today. Um, it's been very informative. So if there's anything that you think Gordon and Lou or myself haven't covered that you'd like to know about, just uh, type it in now and, we'll, and we, we're happy to uh, have a chat. So what we're gonna do just before we go to the question and answer session, cause it might take a few minutes. For those of you who do need to uh, head off and do other things, we'd just like to say thank you for joining us. And I'd like to officially thank Gordon and Lou now for, for doing this webinar this afternoon. I think it's been fantastic. It's been very, relaxed and very informative. Oh, it's been um, our pleasure. Yeah, so, so we'll do the official thank yous now before we head into the Q&A session. That, that way we're not feeling any pressure to rush on the Q&A in case there's people. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I do know that you've got to go before too long, Gordon, because you've got a client, uh, one of our clients coming to have a look at your boat this afternoon. Correct. Uh, but we might just keep talking for a while, but so some questions are popping in. So we'll just flick over a couple of pages and then we'll start some Q&A. So, um, and as, as we say there, thank you for joining us. Um, this YouTube series is, uh, well, I think this is one of the great things is that uh, you, yourselves and, and Rachel have put together a, a video series of your trip across from France. And that's on the, on, on the uh, Multi Hole Solutions YouTube uh, channel. So people can go uh, on and have a look at those. So that's fantastic. Um, and then, um, as we said at the start, our next webinars, two weeks time, we got the Iliad 70 walkthrough. That's the uh, Iliad that was at the Sydney Boat Show last year. Two weeks after that, we've got the purchasing your pre-owned multi hole. Two weeks after that, we've got the walkthrough of the MY44, which was the, yacht, uh, the power boat we had on display in Sydney last weekend. And then, you touched on uh, first aid there, Lou. There's so much in terms of marine first aid. So we're yeah. going to dedicate a, a webinar to that in two weeks time, uh, in, uh, on the 28th of August. And then the Mariner Boating uh, webinar to talk about cruising the Greek islands and, and uh, Turkey. So, uh, and also to talk more about the event that we'll be having next year. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what's coming up. Oh, I'll just go back one. Sorry, that's my fault. And so now we'll just pop back there to the Q&A page and I'll just bring up the questions. So first of all, a really interesting question that got asked by Rod Gordon and Lou. And I, I wanted to bring it up earlier, but I just thought that it might need a, a couple of minutes of explanation. Would you comment briefly on contingency planning? And I thought about you with this, Gordon, because you're an ex-Qantas pilot. You probably have heard the word contingency planning a lot. And, and the question is medical emergency response, significant equipment failure, what resources or outside resources were available to you? At what position were you farthest from assistance? Very, very interesting question. Um, we, we did an Atlantic crossing with Jimmy Cornell group in 2014. And it was interesting learning the the, the range of their rescue helicopters or aircraft they have uh, into the Atlantic, you really are reliant on other shipping. Once you get away by you know, two or 300 nautical miles out into the Atlantic, you're starting to push, push the range of these helicopters, et cetera, that can get out and offer you assistance as well. So if you've got major medical res 
you know, events, you're going to have to manage those on board yourself. That's where that medical um, story will come back into its own there. And that's why it's important to have the correct equipment on board or, or, or you know, resources on board to cope. But in terms of product failure, the boat itself, uh, it has a lot of sort of uh, backup features in a sense, like you've got an extra water pump, you've got, and, and it comes back to your experience levels too, and what you do carry. We carry extra blocks, we carry extra sheeting, we carry, um, we carry enough food that will cover us for an extra few weeks. Um, you've always got uh, a list of items that you, you, but you don't want to keep, you can keep loading your boat up more and more and more, but uh, you'll find that you've got two engines on your boat. You know, you, you've got a lot of little things like that, that on a catamaran that um, will help you. And it's a sailing boat. Yes. So, you know, the features of, uh, and these boats are pretty much uh, unsinkable too. If you had a catastrophic sort of event, it will float, it won't sink. Um, we've always been told we carry a, a really good life raft with a very good um, long, uh, stay. long stay, what they call a long kit. stay kit that, 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 that you have on board as well. So then you're reliant then on your AIS system working initially or your uh, EPIRB system being active and active, activated. Uh, yeah, look, there are, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of, say, um, but wait, the, yep, sorry. The, the convenience and the importance of having a satellite communication yeah. device that will enable you to ask the questions. If you, if you're c concerned about something, either with equipment failure or health issues, you can get help online and ask the questions and get some sort of assistance. And that's where the Iridium too, you yeah. can have your Iridium phone, satellite Iridium hand phone too. And that's another resource to carry on board as a backup as well. So you have got a lot of options to, to supply, you know, to set up your boat to cope with these and sorts where, of situations. Where was your Point Nemo? Where was the point in your trip where you were the furthest away from everything? Uh, that would have been in the Pacific in, in, our, in our passage from, say, between Galapagos and... Uh, Tahiti, yeah. yeah, Tahiti. So that that passage from Panama, actually Panama to Tahiti, is four and a half thousand nautical miles. So it's about eight hundred miles to Galapagos. So you've got um, three thousand seven hundred nautical miles of water between those Galapagos and Tahiti, and so that that's a big area of nothing. You know, you've got very little resources out there to call on once you get midway there, and that's when you're reliant on other boats in the area. Really, it's uh, shipping that may be there. But like we said, it, COVID, I think it's shocked, stopped a lot of, uh, there were no cruise boats operating really. Um, and so were, um, yeah. apparently you're the Pacific Baron. <laughs> <laughs> the Pacific Baron. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll just say uh, someone called Charles mentioned that. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> So yeah, you've got, uh, look, once you reach Tahiti, you've got a lot of options then in between islands, et cetera. You've got help that's handy, but out in those open areas, you've got to be self-sufficient. And, and you know, you are on a very, very, uh, uh, especially the Orbi, you're on a very safe and comfortable yeah. cruising catamaran. So you, very you, good. This could be adventure. But also- and then, you, um, you, One of the other questions care. there. So mm -hmm. One of the other questions there is uh, how long and, and how often, and I know we talked about this on the weekend, it was a question you got asked a lot, how often did you run the generator? Oh, every day. Uh, that was run regularly. The, that was where we carried, the fuel was mainly for the generator because we were on a sailing boat. We only put 150 hours up on our engines between uh, France, and, France and Australia. So we That's did 13,500 13 nautical miles or a little bit more. And... It was mainly the generator that ran up the hours because uh, towards the evening, we would start the generator. It was burning 2.4 litres an hour, but we were running it to, to cool the cabin down so Louise could cook. It was hot. The water temperature was 32 degrees after we left the Galapagos area. It was very hot. The boat was hot. So we'd put the generator on, we could use the microwave. But the other thing was making water. So for three hours of running, we were doing cooling, um, cooking, 
making water and charging your batteries because we only had 400 watt solar. So we had to use that to top the batteries off as the sun went down in the afternoon, the, the, the power draw with your freezers in that temperature, 32 degrees, the power draw with your freezer fridge running all the time, your automatics going, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, the generator was used twice a day. It, it run in the evening and I'd run it again very early in the morning. About and did you take months. much spare fuel? 200 litres was all we carried extra. So we had 670 litres total on board. And then when you arrived in Tahiti after the longest crossing, how much fuel did you have left? Um, about 100 litres, a bit over 100 litres. So we, I was, that was part of this managing role um, with getting through the doldrums. I'd allocated a certain amount of fuel to burn over, you know, the fuel burn on the engines with one engine is three and a half litres an hour, give you seven knots, just under seven knots. Uh, so we were, I'd catered, I'd worked out our fuel burn. So sorry, stopping you there, Gordon, are you saying that quite often you would just run one engine and do seven knots? Yes. Yeah. Yes. At 1800 revs, which is its economy cruise burn, fuel burn for that engine, the 60 horsepower engine with folding props. So it, it, we came down the East Coast from um, Brisbane, uh, the Gold Coast recently, and we were just using one engine at times, and that's easily made seven knots with one engine, which is pretty impressive on a big boat like this. It's quite, you know, it isn't a light boat, but it moves through the water beautifully. This new hull design. It and you, you all, you alternate which engine you start on a given day, so you're not uh, getting your engine hours out of whack? Correct, yes. Yep. Uh, if we motor sailing though, if we, we, we actually do it sometimes to motor sail, um, you look at your autopilot and just check which way your rudder that is, you know, if you're running, balance. Them, balance it up. So you just run the opposite engine to balance it all up. So it's countering That's your- It's all coming out of the one fuel tank, isn't it? So you don't yeah. have the fuel. You don't have the uh, uh, the fuel tank issue. It's all out of one fuel tank, yeah. 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 That's correct. Okay. And then David's asked a great question. Is there anything you would do differently, and what would you provision differently? Okay. Um, Good question. Yeah, I was quite happy. I was happy with the provisioning. Was the provisioning all right? It was, it, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I've got a very talented uh, short order cook who uh, yeah. the provisioning worked beautifully actually. Yeah, and I've got to say we um, we ate very well. Something that we uh, you know people ask, what do you do when you're on board to uh, keep yourself fit and healthy? Do you have an exercise routine, etc.? I have to say no. We don't follow any particular uh, exercise routine, but we always feel so fit healthy and supple just the movement of the boat your general movement around the boat and activity we always feel very fit after a long long cruise like oh and you looked at too oh, thank you Greg. <laughs> thanks Greg. thank you Greg. Oh, but being... we ate really well i mean there were occasions when i would say who's hungry at morning tea time do you feel like pancakes and maple syrup? And we'd have these huge <laughs> snacks and then we'd have lunch and then we'd have afternoon tea and then we'd have dinner. It, uh, yeah, you get a, a very healthy appetite out on the ocean. But the provisioning, um, we, we had enough food on, on, uh, on hand and the Elba made it very easy to keep all of the food fresh and have it stored properly. But to, to get back to David's question too, what would we do differently? What would we do differently? Um, yeah, I, would, really. I wouldn't probably sail a parasail up at night now into, into those winds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be one of my rules now. I'd stick to that. And we did yeah, that with the Jenica, learned. lesson learned, and we applied that with the Jenica. So we were very, very diligent with that. Mm. We stuck to 12 knots apparent as a trigger to furl it and put the... Uh, uh, Jenica away and that's what we did and every evening we never flew the Jenica at night so yeah we were being and, and that's what you need to do on those big passages you've got to be a bit more cautious and bit conservative and bit now, conservative. I, I was locked out of Queensland as well but I know Mark and Anna met you when you arrived can you just as a final thing can you tell everyone what Mark <laughs> said about the condition of the boat when you arrived well we were met by Mark and Nod Michael Crook and 
uh, they were absolutely stunned really. They were quite impressed and, and blown away with the condition of this boat, which we'd sailed halfway around the world nearly. Uh, it had done three boat shows uh, up in Europe and just Mark said, have you been detailing and looking after this boat, Gordon, on the way home? And I said, well, no, we haven't touched it, Mark. And that was true. And the boat looked beautiful. And still it, shiny it still looked uh, smelt nick. new. It look, mm. looks like a brand new boat still. And they, people who visited us last Friday, Saturday would agree with that. They've seen it and they were so impressed with the finish on that boat. And all we've done since then really is polish the stainless steel on the outside and give it a wash. But the boat itself, it's beautifully put together. So yeah, very, very impressed. They were very pleased. Well, listen, folks, that's it. I think you've done a tremendous job and sorry to um, drag you out for an hour and a half. We're going to have to break this one into episodes, I think, for the YouTube channel. Um, no, but, uh, a, a fantastic uh, a presentation, lots of information. We could go on for longer and longer. Um, but um, yeah, look, on behalf of all of us at Multi Hole Solutions, we'd just like to say thank you for sharing your uh, insights into what was a, an amazing trip. And as I've said many times, I felt like it was we were watching the Truman Show. Uh, <laughs> there wasn't much else to watch. There wasn't much else to see at that time with COVID. There was no sport. There was no, not much else at all. So the one thing we did have to follow and tune into was the Gordon and Lou, the Gordon and Lou Show. <laughs> Well, can I just say too, Greg, before you go, um, multi health Solutions through all of this have been absolutely amazing as a company that stand behind their customers. And we had the most incredible support going through this situation across the Pacific, well, everywhere, right from the word go, actually. One of those images further back when we were doing the tender onto the back of the boat, standing on the left there was Roms, who's the agent who works for you up in La Rochelle. Now, you know, to have that sort of presence everywhere around the world, someone like that, or contact by the Iridium or whatever email system, yeah. um, you guys were awesome, and especially you, Greg. Uh, we just loved your um, <laughs> communication support. and support mm. throughout all of that COVID, especially. That was the period we really uh, appreciated your help there. And into the future, anyone who's watching and listening to this, uh, we are extremely, we're pleased that you are uh, uh, watching and listening, but we're here to help uh, educate people and and help the Multi Health Solutions team with their efforts to, uh, you know, they want to uh, see you enjoy and sail around the world and do what your dream is, but we're here to help and they will pass on, or if you want to uh, chat or learn more, we're happy to answer all your questions by email. So go to info. I think it's multi health solutions have a, uh, a web address, oh, sorry, an email address. Correct, Greg. And they can use that to uh, contact us. That's definitely right. So that's fantastic. Thank you. So these things are always hard to finish, but basically what I'm going to say now is uh, there is one question there. Uh, yep. Uh, just a, a thank you. Um, so on this note, I'm going to press stop. And uh, we'll finish for today. And I'll, I'll see you, Gordon and Lou, probably on the 17th and 18th when we're planning to do some uh, test sailing down well, there in Port Hacking. So, and I'll chat to you uh, later on this evening after I've spoken to uh, yes. Ian. So, yes. Very good. Thank okay, you, so thank you. Uh, I just need to um, um, 